stay standing with us as we continue to worship this morning. Join us. How the Father's house is secret waiting at an open door to empty sea when a stranger's name is found at his table the Holy One makes a place for me this is the kingdom of heaven he's shown us we are your children 
gave you life for mine. Nail to a cross, you crucified all my sin and shame. He was washed by your mercy. You are the treasure I find. I'm reason for living. So let my life become an offering to the one who is worthy. Oh, I'll praise you, the Lord Most High. Oh, I'll praise to the one who saved my life. Oh, I'll praise to Jesus Christ, our King of Heaven.
scripture out of the book of Mark, chapter 14. It's an excerpt from the Last Supper, verse 22. While they, the disciples, were eating with Jesus, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Today, we remember the work of Christ on the cross by taking communion. We do it as an act of remembrance. It's not something that necessarily saves us by doing it, but I do find that these tangible and practical acts of worship are things that can recenter our hearts and remind us of the gift that we have in Jesus. And so we're instructed to do it and and to do it often. And I find that really helpful. seen that the older you get in life, the more disciplines you maybe acquire and build in your life or attempt to build in your life because you realize that you can't do life on your own strength without these disciplines. And the Lord is so kind to us by giving us these practices so that we might not forget the power of his blood and the power of his sacrifice over our lives. Something that I found so powerful over the weekend um, Our elders were on a retreat, just seeking the Lord, spending time with one one another, um, spending time in the scriptures. And I was reading in the book of Acts and there's just something really interesting in chapter two. um, Luke's speaking about, about Jesus and he's saying, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep a hold of him. And that just moved me over the weekend to think that, you know, Jesus sacrificed himself for us, but the beauty of that sacrifice is that death could not keep a hold on him. And he's the only one that death could not keep a hold on. Isn't that something worth celebrating today? Isn't that something worth worth worshiping him for today? Yeah, amen. Come on, let's clap our hands. It's okay. I know it's early. These realities are life-changing. And they ought to move us to act out on them. To just put them in the back of our brain and carry on in life would be foolish to begin with, but also what's the point? What's the point of even being here? And so today we take communion, we go before the Lord in prayer, we ask him to remind us of that power that he's offered us, that life, that everlasting life that he's offered us the forgiveness that he's offered us. Maybe someone in here today needs to hear that the Lord loves you, that the Lord has forgiven you, that you're not unforgivable, that you have grace offered to you today and mercy offered to you today. Maybe you haven't felt like you can receive that gift. None of us deserve it, but that's the beauty of grace is that it is just given to you today. So as you take communion, let that represent this grace poured out for you today. As we continue to worship him, there's elements on the chairs. Would you go ahead and take a moment and open them? If this is your first time opening them, there's two layers. I would open the top most layer first. It's easier. And in 10 seconds when the noise stops, I'll pray for us. And we'll just take a moment to reflect on the gift of life that Christ has given us as we take communion together. It's only through you, Lord, that we might have life. It's only through you, Lord, that we might have forgiveness and grace that can cover the brokenness 
It's only through you, Lord, that we might see the truth and hear the truth. And it's only through you, Lord, that we might live and live eternally. And so we thank you for that today, God. We thank you for that sacrifice. Lord, the blood poured out, your body broken for us, taking on what we could not take on ourselves, bearing the weight of sin. I mean, I know myself, Lord, even a day of falling short is enough to move me into burdenedness and conviction and guilt and shame, Lord, but Lord, you lift that from us with your grace, and so we just thank you for that today and worship you in light of that today, and we are witnesses of your grace today, Lord, and so we sing of that now in Jesus' name. You 
over our lives. You are so great, you're worth offering everything to. So we come before you, Lord, asking that your presence would dwell in this place, that you'd actually would meet with your people this morning, that we could hear from your word that's alive, that has something to say to us today, and that we'd be reminded of your goodness, we'd be reminded of your grace and your love for us, Lord, that we'd be reminded of how good and pure and perfect you are that we would set after a life for you and for your glory. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. Great to see you all this morning. Thank you for joining us here at Branches HB. Um, you know, this church is made up of the wonderful people that are here around you. So would you just take a moment and say hello to someone. Take, take, take some time, ask them how they're doing and we'll continue in a moment.
Good morning, Branches Church. I guess specifically the 8.30 service. I'll be honest with you, I don't on it often get here for 8.30, so it's great to see everybody. Um, my name is Kevin Carkett. I currently have the privilege of serving as a member of the Elder Board here at Branches. And um, we're going to get ready now to transition into a time of giving. Um, I like to always think of giving as really just an opportunity that God gives us to partner with the church and what God is looking to do through the church. Um, we have opportunity to give of our time, and this is another opportunity to give of resources that God has blessed us with. So in a moment here, um, ushers will pass baskets around. Um, I know we always like to say for, for anyone here the very first time, please do not feel obligated to put anything in the basket. We're just thankful you're here. Um, before I uh, pray over the offering, I know also that many of you give online at brancheshb.com. So that's another way in which you can um, use of your resources. So before I pray, I'd like to read just a couple verses out of Psalm 100. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, as we do enter your gates, which is basically entering into your presence, we thank you. We want to enter with thanksgiving. Father, even if we are going through a season of difficulty, um, we can always look into our lives and see that there are many things to be thankful for. So we do want to thank you right now for the blessings you've placed upon each one of us here, Father. And we just pray, um, we want to pray for wisdom for those that you um, put as stewards over the resources that are um, given to branches. We pray you give those stewards wisdom, discernment, Lord, and how best to use those resources. So, Father, we thank you. We just look forward to what you have for us, the remainder of this service. It's all committed into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, go ahead and turn to the screens for some announcements. Hi, church. I'm Corey Camp, and I'm the director of Congregational Life and Communications here with a bunch of fun upcoming events to invite you into. First up, on Friday, May 10th, Serve City is hosting a citywide gathering of Huntington Beach churches for a night of united fellowship and worship in Central Park. We'll be praying together for ministry in the city, singing songs led by worship leaders from several HB churches, and enjoying food and hanging out together. So join us from 5 to 7 p.m. at the bandstand located in Central Park East, right behind Central Library for the citywide worship event. So grab a friend, a neighbor, and let us know how much food to provide by registering at, at brancheshb.com. Our Young Adults Ministry is having a barbecue today at 5 p.m. over at Austin and Kara's house downtown. If you're newer around here and you've been wanting to meet other people in your life stage, this event is definitely for you. They'll have smash burgers and sides, so come enjoy some food and meet other young adults at Branches. Register at brancheshb.com for location details, and we hope you can make it. Starting this Thursday, April 25th, we're hosting Seriously Dating and Engaged, a six-week pre-marriage course led by our very own Brock Snook. We'll be using Roger Tirabasi's book, Seriously Dating and Engaged, which is an excellent resource for couples that are approaching the commitment of marriage. So if you're dating or engaged, we encourage you to check out this class to help get you on track for a healthy relationship with your spouse. The cost is $35 per couple, and you can register for the class on our website. 
Lastly, this announcement is for all my fellow bookworms. If you love to read and want to grow in your discipleship to Jesus, I encourage you to come check out Branches Book Club. This is a space for all ages and walks of life to come discuss ideas grounded in the person of Christ through reading theological books, developmental how-tos, and Christian fiction together. On Monday, May 20th, we'll be gathering at the Branches Warehouse to discuss the classic Christian book, The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. If you've never heard of it, I promise it has nothing to do with actual divorce and is instead a fictional take on heaven and hell. It's pretty powerful and very creative. So grab a copy of the book, read it over the next month, it's short, I promise, and register at brancheshb.com and come ready to discuss the book with me. Okay, so as a roundup, we have a young adults barbecue today, a seriously dating and engaged class starting Thursday, a citywide worship night coming up in May, and a book to start reading over the next month if you plan on coming to book club in May. So much good stuff. All right, now let's welcome up Andrew Shea as he continues our series in generosity. Howdy, everybody. Good morning to you. Uh, as Corey said, so many good things going on, and we are in this short series on generosity, following up on the meditation that I gave us on the goodness and graciousness of God to us through the Easter message. And when you think about God's nature and you consider the meaning of the giving of Jesus, God's Son, I think we can agree with Paul who looks ahead to eternity and says in Romans eight thirty-two, he who did not spare his own Son but gave him up for us all... How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? I mean, that's the mindset of a Christian. you got to understand, it's like, if you've got a friend who helps you move on moving day, they'll be there for you any day of your life, right? If they'll go that far, they're there, right? Uh, So if God is going to give the thing of highest value, that is his very own son, then there's nothing he's going to hold back. We serve a generous, gracious, giving God. And that's what ought to set us apart as believers in the world. We Christians, I'm not talking about Christians someone else. I'm not talking about Christians in every other church gathering this morning. I'm talking about we Christians, us. We should be the most generous, open-hearted people on this planet Earth. This room should represent the most generous, open-hearted, giving, and gracious people that are living in this region, in Huntington Beach and in the surrounding areas. That's our response to what we've received. Now, I know our mind jumps to money when we think about generosity, and that is definitely a part of living a gracious life, is using our money, our resources, and giving those away. But that's not even going to be something we talk about in this series What have we talked about so far? What does this generous life amount to? Well, it means being generous with our fellowship, being inclusive and welcoming, you know, open arms, open hearts to the people around us, just as Jesus was with his fellowship. We also looked at being generous with our time and how giving it to God teaches us how we can be generous with that resource with other people. Now, today I want to talk about becoming generous and giving with our speech and with our words. If you want, you can open up to James chapter 3. That's where we're going to begin this morning. If you need a Bible, our ushers were already going around. They were ready. They were gracious. They were giving. They wanted to give you some Bibles. If you want one, go ahead and raise your hand, and they'll give one to you. We're opening up to James chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 3. Because I guess I want to start where the Bible does, when we begin to think about our words, when we begin to think about our speech. We're going to start with a warning. Because just as there are time takers, not givers, and just as there are resource takers, not givers, so we have to first understand our words have the power to take, not just to give. Our words have the power to withdraw, not just deposit into people's lives. James writes about this consuming power of the tongue in chapter 3, starting in verse 2. That's where we're going to pick up. He says, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. 
Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Now, he doesn't give us a lot of room for interpretation here about what he thinks about the tongue. He's clearly a big fan. He goes, wow, what does he just say here? Our tongue, he says, is like a world of evil. It's like Las Vegas. Las Vegas is a world of debauchery, right? Pick your poison. You know, you can express it this way, you can express it that way. The tongue, our speech, our words are a world of evil. There's a, there's a multitude of ways that we can use them that are damaging, and has the power to corrupt the whole body. It's like the source, the origin of rot that works its way through our whole life. It can set the whole course of one's life on fire. And he says it is itself set on fire by hell. This is such a vivid metaphor for understanding the consuming, destructive potential of our words. Fire. It's when he used in verse 3 when he talked about this forest being set on fire by just a small spark. Think about that. A forest representing, you know, hundreds of trees. All this life. Hundreds of years in the making. All this gradual growth. And then just consumed by something as small as a spark. Uh, Think of the Maui wildfires. All that life. Gone in moments by one small flame. Likely a downed power line, sparking. James's words make me think of Notre Dame, the cathedral in Paris. It caught fire in 2019. And that fire burned for three and a half hours. And in that time, it caused nearly $800 million of damage. In just three and a half hours, it caused $800 million worth of structural damage. And investigators say it was caused by possibly an electrical short or a poorly extinguished cigarette, which is the most French thing I've ever heard, (laughs) right? That's the destructive potential of our words. A, A monument that stood for 850 years, destroyed in three and a half hours. That's the destructive potential of our speech, of our words. They are also able to destroy in moments what takes eras to build. This is a theme in the Bible. As in James, Proverbs 15, 4 says, the soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Proverbs 12, 18, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And we'll get to the positive potential before we close this morning, but first we have to reckon with the truth that a perverse tongue crushes the spirit, that reckless words pierce like a sword. And I don't know if you've noticed this theme in your own life, but those reckless words, right? Those perverse words, they're more sticky with our soul than the positive words, than the constructive words. Am I right on this? I don't know if you've noticed that. The destructive potential of our words and how it's outsized, it's weighted toward the negative. That's why when I was teaching martial arts to kids, we had a principle. If you're going to correct a kid, you've got to pair it with five positives. And that's not because every kid's a soft little snowflake. It's just, it's how we work. I cannot remember a positive thing that was said to me yesterday. I can't remember anything positive that was said to me a week ago. But I can remember clear as day six years ago when I got done with the sermon and the first person that came up to me said, you got a demon. I can remember that clear as day. That was the person I cared for. I love that person. They came up to me and they prayed for me. Oh, you are demon possessed. I can remember that. I can't remember what someone said to me yesterday that was nice, but I can remember when somebody told me I'm not faithfully preaching the word of God. I don't have zeal. I don't have passion for the mission of God. I remember being told, oh, you ruined the witness to one of the visitors that I brought to church because of the way you preached. Oh, and they're not coming back again. I can remember that word. Still remember that COVID email someone sent me where they called me a soy boy? You guys remember that one? I had to look it up. I had to Google it. I didn't have to Google some of the things he called me, but I had to Google that one. It's pejorative, it's a negative statement, it says you're effeminate, 
You have low testosterone because you eat meat replacement food, soy. Golly. Oh, all because I was preaching. We need to be compassionate and humble during COVID. Yeah, that's a sermon no one needed to hear, right? I don't remember a lot of the positive things that are said to me. But I can take you through a lot of reckless things that have been said to me, right? I can feel those things just like I can feel, you know, one day when I was woodworking and the chisel went boom, right through one side of the finger, out the other, pierce. Oh, I can go right back there, right? I can go right back to the words that do the same thing through my heart. And I can only imagine the words you've heard in this reckless world, If we could just do a catalog, I mean, I can keep going, but I bet you could just take a few moments and we could just start brainstorming all the things, all the reckless words, all the piercing words you've heard, and what about all the reckless words we've said? Where does all that destructive speech come from? Well, in one pronounced conflict with religious leaders, let's turn to Matthew chapter 12, in one pronounced conflict that started with them actually doing the same thing they got done to me. Someone came up and said, Jesus, you're possessed by a demon. You know, the, the religious leaders are always negating Jesus' works with their words. This is how he responds. He gets to the heart of the matter regarding our words in verse 34. You brood of vipers, Jesus responds, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned." So Jesus tells us the heart is like this underground spring, and our words are what bubble to the surface. You know, for good or for ill, to build or destroy. And this is how closely Jesus links what's coming out of us with what is going on inside of us. He says, at the judgment, it's by our words we will be acquitted or condemned. He's essentially saying that all God needs to make a clear and righteous judgment about each of us is to get a transcript of our life. All he needs is for the you know, court recorder of the Holy Spirit to read back what was said, and there's enough there to make a judgment because there we are on the page. Like a doctor gets a blood panel, you know, takes some of your blood and it reads out, you know, in words, in black and white, and there is your health on a page. So the health of our soul, our very selves, is read through the words of our life. You have everything you need to know about a heart, about a person through what they've said, Because evil words are an evil heart is the evil person. And good words is the good heart is the good person. So what's the transcript of your life say about you? Now maybe you're a little like me and feeling a sense of conviction. A little bit of heat in the sermon because you got a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And by Jesus' logic, that's not just with your words, that's in your heart. You got a little bit of this, a little bit of good, a little bit of evil. And that contradiction in our hearts is exactly what James goes on to identify in that text that we started with. Jump back to James chapter 3. He begins to talk about how the heart can be a mix of these different realities, how our words can end up being sort of like brackish water, neither fresh nor salty, a little bit of both, neither good nor evil, but a little bit of both. And that's an issue. Verse 9, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth, this is to Christians, come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. He's saying, guys, this and this don't belong together. If we're a fresh water spring, where's that salt water coming from? If we're a fig tree bearing this sweet fruit, how come those bitter olives are showing up on the branches? They don't belong on that tree. So if we find that our words 
are reckless, if they're destructive toward not just Christians, he says toward human beings, anyone made in God's likeness, that means if our words are destructive, if they're perverse toward all people, some of you need to remember that in an election year that's coming up. If there's cursing in a Christian, we got to go back to the headwaters of our heart and ask for a cleansing and healing word to be spoken in it by the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus continually offers us. When he refers to his own words in a sermon captured in John chapter 6, verse 63, he declares that his words are the words that are full of the Spirit and full of life. And when we receive Jesus' words into our hearts and the word of the gospel, that is the message of his death and resurrection, it's the equivalent of drinking of Jesus as the water of life, which he says is going to well up into a spring within us that's going to flow out and it's going to you know, grow and grow into this eternal life that's really, you know, the images, we're exuding it. So if you and I want fresh water in our hearts and flowing out our mouths, it's as simple as fresh water in, fresh water out. It's like you ever paid someone a compliment and they pay it back instantly? That's what always happens. You compliment somebody, you say, man, you're so great at this. You know what they do? And they go, you know what? You're so great at that. And it kind of just ends up going back and forth. And you end up in one of those, I love you, man, situations. You know, it's because a generous word It's contagious. It's fresh in. It's fresh out. And there's no one who speaks a more generous, gracious, healing word than the Spirit of God as we recall, as we meditate on our state, as forgiven through the cross of Jesus, as the Spirit is constantly testifying in our hearts that we are children of God, that we're cleansed, washed, sanctified, justified, inheritors of the kingdom come, loved, recipients of the gift of God's Son. What is God going to hold back from us? It's that generous word of the gospel for us, the kindness of God that brings us to repentance, that renews our hearts, that makes us born again and produces an outflow of the Spirit through us that is constructive and good in our speech. And that's the goal for our words. Ephesians 4, verse 29 commands, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Similarly, Colossians 4, 6 commands us, let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You see, this is the ideal for our words. It's not enough to just get rid of the corrupting speech I've warned about. But we're called to utilize our words to benefit others, to impart grace. It's to be seasoned with salt. That's what our speech is to be. Now, what does all this mean? These words that are imparting grace. Well, what is grace? Grace is a favor. Grace is goodwill. Grace is undeserved kindness. Our words are supposed to be like a gift to other people. What does it mean that our Words are to be seasoned with salt. What does salt do? Salt enhances. It enhances sensation. I could really geek out on the science here, but you know that's why when you throw salt in a wound, it hurts more. The same sort of thing is going on when you put it on your tongue. It's enhancing the sensation. And the most miraculous thing about salt is it actually is selective in what it enhances. It actually reduces and numbs and nullifies bitter flavors for us as human beings, and it brings out sweetness. That's why you got to try some salt on a chocolate chip cookie. Your mind is absolutely blown. Those are the words. Those are the words of a Christian. Those are the words of a follower of Jesus. This is our speech. We numb the bitter. And we enhance and we bring out the good with grace. Now this should be very reorienting for some of us because some of us are very clinical with our words. We think it's right to be like a doctor with bed, bad side, bedside manner, you know? I don't know if you've ever been the victim of a doctor with terrible bedside manner. They, just, they tell you the truth and they tell it to you without any salt. They just give it to you plain as day, right? 
And some of us are like that. We are accurate and exacting in our speech. We get by by saying, well, I'm a truthful person. I'm an honest person. Yeah, you're honestly a jerk. (laughs) And everyone thinks so. That's not the picture that's painted here. It's like if we're in a metaphorical rowboat and God is rowing in a direction, destructive, corrupting speech rows in the opposite direction. That is plain. That is clear as day. But idle, empty words, these accurate brutally honest. Why do we have a phrase like that? Brutally honest words. It's like you're not even putting your paddle in the water. That is not the ideal. That's not the goal. If we want to row with God, we need to actively speak graciously salty words that enhance others. For what are Jesus' words to us? What has he spoken over us? His words are aspirational for us. They imbue us with value we don't possess in ourselves. They lift us up. Consider how husbands are told to love their wives as Christ loved the church in Ephesians 5.27. Husbands are presenting their wives without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. Now the question is, in my relationship with my wife, does she have no stain? Does she have no wrinkle? Does she have no blemish? And the right answer for all you husbands out there is, no, she doesn't. She's absolutely perfect. But what is it in reality? Is she perfect? Am I without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish? Yet what does Jesus say of me through the cross? So our words are for ironing out wrinkles. They're for laundering stains. It's like when my son is pitching on the mound in Little League, you know, and he's having a hard time, and I tell him, you got this. That's what I'm telling him. The question, does he have this? No. No. He's struggling. And I can tell you five different ways that he could do something different. I could be brutally honest with him, right, and yell it out from the stands. And let me tell you, some parents are doing that. But instead I say, you've got this. It's aspirational. I can picture a future that's good and constructive. I'm calling him up into it where the wrinkles are ironed out and the stains are laundered. I'm building him up. I'm enhancing him just as Jesus looks at us where we are and calls us holy and into holiness. That's an aspirational future that he's building for us. Now let me clarify something. I'm not suggesting that we just have this church filled with flattery. That's not what I'm talking about. Flattery is false speech that gives to take. The gracious speech seasoned with salt are true words that give to give. And again, don't get me wrong, there's a place for correction, but I've dealt with my fair share of ch- church discipline, and I've you know, been on both sides of it, and I know the difference between discipline and correction that crushes and pierces, and that which restores and rebuilds. Like we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 4, verse 1, excuse me, never speak harshly to an older man but appeal to him respectfully as you would your own father. Talk to younger men as you would your own brothers. Right? You see, I've been corrected by someone to boost their ego or to be a source for them to work out their own pain. And I've been lovingly restored and called higher with a salty reproof, just as Jesus does with us, because that person genuinely loved me. I'll tell you what, the world is desperate for the words I'm describing, for a drink of fresh water, for some salty speech, because the word of our world today is bitter. It's vile. It's vindictive. The words of our world today are toxic, because the heart of our world and culture is sick. It's desperate for the generous word and words of Jesus that to us are spirit and life, and we are the vessels to bring those words. Let me finish with a few thoughts, summarizing what we've read here in the Scriptures. Number one, we are what we say. We are what we say. You can draw a straight line from the words coming out of your mouth to who you are as a person. So the choice for us is, are we going to represent a world of evil, With our words, are we going to be like in the proverb I read at the beginning, a tree of life? Just think about that kind of person, a tree of life. Everywhere they go, they've got branches extending to people. 
giving them gifts, imparting grace. You know, that's who we get to be with our words all through the day. You can be with the grocery clerk. Are you that tree of life with a branch extending to that person, giving them a gift, imparting to them grace, words that enhance? Is that who you are in your office building? Is that who you are at home with your roommates, with your spouse, with your children, with your brothers and sisters in the church? We are what we say. If we want to say things that are fresh and salty, man, fresh water in, fresh water out. It's out of the heart that the mouth speaks. So we got to pray God speak to our hearts. Guys, you ever do that exercise when you're a kid in school where you take the white carnation and you put it in the water that's got the dye, the food coloring, and the flower soaks up the liquid and becomes the color of whatever it's sitting in. You know, a red carnation, a blue carnation, a green one. We are that flower. What we're soaking in, that oftentimes is what is coming out. So what's coming in in your life? Is it everything on social media? Is it all the vile speech of the news? Is all you're listening to the dialogue of pundits and politicians? Brackish water in, brackish water out. The words of Jesus alone are spirit and they are life. If we want to see fresh water flow from us, if we want salty seasoned speech, we've got to receive it first from the Lord. My final Statement is not a statement, it's a question. Do your words give or take? Do your words enhance or detract? Do they build or destroy? Or are they simply idle, empty, nothing at all? Jesus said we'll give an account for those as well. Because we have the power to crush and pierce. We can destroy like fire. We can be of no use at all. Or we can iron and cleanse and be a source of healing for others. This morning, I want to practice what I'm preaching. I want to give us the opportunity to be those trees of life for people who need it in this room. Right now, I'd like to give an opportunity to pray for those who, inside, your dialogue is characterized by negativity. You have self-critical statements that make up your own self-understanding about who you are, things that negate, negate, negate. And maybe the source of that dialogue in you is something you heard in your workplace this last week. Maybe it's something you heard all the way back from your parents when you were a kid. Maybe it's just something you inherited along the way in a culture that's as toxic as ours. But for those of you, and maybe there's one, maybe there's two, I don't care how many there are, we're going to build someone up in the grace of God this morning. We're going to use our words for the purpose God gave us them. If that's you, if you feel like there's just that critical dialogue about yourself going on in your heart, I want to invite you to stand right now to receive prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Words that detract like you're not enough. You've got to be this. You've got to be that. You're not loved. No one likes you. No one's going to accept you. You're a screw up. If some of you have that negative dialogue, Please give us the opportunity to pray for you. Would you stand now? Just want to say real quickly, sometimes when I would preach and I'd share something from my own life, when I tell everyone, hey, someone called me a soy boy in an email. I wake up the next morning and I regret being vulnerable because I'd be afraid of what it means that people actually know what's going on in my life and my heart. 
That's the only time real ministry can happen is when we're really honest. And that feeling has diminished over the years. Now, I live open-hearted. And that's the only way this church is going to be able to grow and our lives are going to be able to grow is when we're honest and open, not afraid to be vulnerable. So if there's anyone that's got that negative dialogue in their head, I'm just going to ask you and invite you one more time. Would you stand? Not be afraid to be vulnerable. But leave room for the Lord to minister to you. To do real work in your heart with the real things that are going on in there. Thank you. For those of you who are seated around those who are standing, would you stand with them? And now you're being called into service. These beautiful people, these humble people, these honest souls that are leading us this morning, we get the opportunity to minister to them and practice what's been preached. So would you lay a hand on them if that's okay? Maybe they want to share with you the thing that they hear in their head. Maybe they don't. Maybe they say, I can't even share it. I don't even want to share it. But would you begin to bless them and speak what is true by the Holy Spirit? What you know of them, if you know them, or just what is true through Jesus' eyes for these that have stood this morning. Begin to pray out loud. Let's bless them with these words, gracious words, salty words, words that are actually true, beautifully true, not brutally honest, beautifully true in the Lord. Just begin to pray. Let's pray for them.
Amen. What we just practiced in here, that is our mission, leaving this space. What you witnessed or what you participated in, this is the work God calls us to, sending you out from this space to see those around you and to be generous and gracious and gift others with the words that are full of the Spirit and full of life, the words of Jesus. Let me bless us into that. Would you extend your hands in a posture of receiving this blessing? And God, we just thank you. We thank you for the kind and gracious and generous words that you speak over us through the cross of Jesus Christ. That we're forgiven, that we're your children, that you're going to withhold nothing from us for all eternity, God. What the world could just see on the surface is sinners. Jesus, you looked at them, you looked at us, and you saw the potential to become saints. And Lord, I pray we'd have the same eyes that we go out into this world sharing your grace, speaking words that are generous, that are a gift to those who hear. Lord, would our words be like salt in this world? Would they enhance your goodness and what you desire to do through the lives of other people? Lord, the world is desperate for that water. It has enough fire. It has enough words that consume. Lord, let us bring the words that are water, like the water of life that you are. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.